The Mishnah says, Me matai maskirin gevurot geshamim. From when do we begin to refer to God's mighty acts of bringing the rain to fall? Rabbi Yoshua says, Miyom tov ha'acharon shel chag. From the last day of the festival, the festival par excellence to the rabbis was Sukkot, and its last day is Shmini Atzeret, leading to the fact that we mention and pray for rain on, at Musa on this festival. All we have in Amach Sorim is really a remnant of these great prayers because the communities in the biblical period and in the times of the rabbis in the Mishnah and the Talmud were farming communities, subsistence communities. They understood that if there was not adequate rainfall or rainfall at the wrong time, famine would follow and disaster after that. Therefore, the people gathered en masse, and these were prayers of the same stature as the prayers we have on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. What we have now is a fragment. People used not to take it seriously in Britain. People would say, well, it rains all the time, doesn't it? Why pray for rain? But this has changed now as our climate has changed and southeast of Britain has become a drought zone. And where Rabbi Mark Soloway is speaking from, from Boulder, Colorado, also there have been an area being afflicted by droughts and then by forest fires. And the world also knows terrible flooding right now as I speak in Pakistan, but elsewhere at different times. So the prayers for rain and for the climate have now assumed again the utmost importance. This is something which Dr. Michael Gilmont from his research and work on the subject knows a great deal about. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Rabbi Jonathan. The prayer for rain speaks of the fundamental importance of water in underpinning our existence. The fragility, the fragility of life without water is all too obvious. Without it, the earth cannot sustain us, cannot sustain the environment in which we live. We only really think about our water needs when we experience reduced availability or quality. Rabbi Jonathan, as, uh, as you've mentioned, many areas of England are now under a hosepipe ban, dramatically restricting the amount of water that we can legally consume around the home. Many argue that much of the UK's current water predicament is based on a lack of investment in water infrastructure, including pipework and storage, and a failure to invest longer term in behavioral tools to manage and avert crisis. Over time, our increased abstraction of water from the natural environment poses a th severe threat to rare aquatic environments that themselves sustain freshwater supply. And in the south of England, uh, that is really uh, uh, emblematic in terms of the, the globally significant chalk streams, um, which, which are suffering tremendously. As individuals, we also seldom realize the true extent of our water needs. The water we directly use for drinking, for cooking, for washing, for cleaning around the home normally amounts to around 150 liters per day. This, however, is a mere 4% of the actual global daily resource that is required to sustain us. A further 3,600 liters per day are required to produce the food that we eat. For example, one serving of bread across its growing and production chain needs over 180 litres of water, so more than that which we directly consume around the home. And despite our rich, wet British agricultural landscape, the vast majority of our food needs here in the UK are imported, and with it then the vast majority of the water that is used to produce that food. The role that this food trade plays in ensuring our water security is, however, invariably silent. In the past year, um, it has been thrust into the spotlight. Um, and this is mainly due to the war in Ukraine, which has precipitated, along with great humanitarian suffering, a severe disruption to grain and other staple supplies. This is due to both the war itself, disrupting harvests and uh, creating refugees out of farmers and also due to blockades of ports that have impeded exports of crops. Both Russia and Ukraine are a key breadbasket for much of Europe, the Middle East and Africa and many of those importing countries simply do not have enough local water to grow grains as a replacement to meet their current populations. Therefore, the political crisis in Eastern Europe has become an extreme challenge to global food markets. 
raising food prices for billions, including those living in areas where there is no alternative, where food imports have silently sustained the growing population for decades, and there is no local physical alternative of water to grow that food. Climate change will impact future rainfall around the world. For some areas, the science is clear. They will get wetter. Others will get drier. For large swathes of humanity, however, the picture is much more complex. Absolute volumes of rainfall won't necessarily change, but the timing of those rains will. And this shift in timing may dramatically impact how much water is actually available for people and for the environment. Shift in rain from winter to more intense storms during the summer, for example, may result in greater evaporation in hot conditions or runoff of flood water over hard soils that, if that rain occurred in winter, would infiltrate into wet ground. Both increased evaporation and runoff will reduce available water that can be used even if total rainfall volumes remain stable. This will present significant challenges in terms of adaptation in both agriculture and water management. Therefore, while we are still fundamentally at the mercy of gift of rain from the heavens, as is starkly expressed in our prayer on Shemini Atzeret, our water vulnerabilities are also shaped by our own human behaviors, management, mismanagement, and politics over short, medium, and long-term horizons. As well as asking for God's favorable judgment on this year's rain, we may do well to ask our fellow humans for new action on current and emerging problems and for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. You, you refer to our dependence on, on prayer for rain. And this is, this is very clear in the Torah. It's very clear throughout our liturgy. The second paragraph of the Shema, if we do not follow God's laws, the heavens will be closed. And perhaps in a way, the treatment of our environment is a way of not having followed God's laws. But I'm conscious that the, the, the need for rain, is, it's, it's in the Shemini Atzeret liturgy. And in a moment, I want to ask uh, Rabbi Mark Soloway about this, because he's Rabbi to Chazon, the biggest and most important um, American environmental, Jewish environmental organization with worldwide influence. I'm going to ask him about it. But I'm also aware that when the high priest on Yom Kippur comes out of the Holy of Holies in peace, the high priest prays for a year which should be Chaim Tovim, it should be a year of good life. And the very next words are Tlula Ugshuma, with adequate dew and adequate rain. And then he says, Shnat Lachmenu Umeimenu Tevarech, a year in which you shall bless our bread and our water. So the absolute dependence of grain on water. There it is in the high priest's prayer. Um, Rabbi Mark, um, Rabbi to Chazon, your thoughts on God, rainfall, God's mighty acts of causing the rain to fall. Thanks. First of all, I should say I'm not actually Rabbi to Chazon. I, I was the, uh, the, the chair of the uh, rabbinical council of Chazon, but haven't been for a couple of years. But... I will. Um, I find the, this prayer extremely powerful. I mean, apart from the immensity of the the liturgy and the poetry, and talks about l'chayim v'lo l'mavet for to life and not not to death, knowing that life and death is really um, a completely can be a consequence of of rain, both in its extreme deluges and its and its um, and its droughts, but. I, 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 I find it very powerful in the section of the Talmud that you referred to. The, the rabbis make a distinction between Haskarat Gashamim mentioning the rain as something that exists within the, the power uh, of God, the power of the universe, and She'alat Gashamim, where we actually ask for the rain. So this prayer that we say on Shemini Atzeret uh, comes in the second uh, blessing of the Amidah, which is known as Gevura, which is about God's strength. And among the things for which we acknowledge God's might and power and strength is the ability to, to make the wind blow and the rains fall. And, and there's something about a type of prayer that is just like, almost like the wow of, the, of those first blessings of the Amidah, where we're just like, this is, the universe is 
and God's power is mighty. And, and that actually we don't, depending where you are in the world, whether you're in the land of Israel or whether you're outside of Israel, the actual asking for rain comes, comes a, lot, a lot later when we, uh, in antiquity, it was about allowing time for the pilgrims who had been in Jerusalem for Sukkot to get home before the rains really started in earnest. But, but, but I think just theologically, this, this difference between mentioning the rains as this awesome power and actually asking for rain, praying for rain, are very different aspects of, of prayer. And, you know, certainly in Colorado, we experience extreme drought in some parts of the state and extreme flooding in other parts of the state. And I have sort of experienced both. Something else that really moved me when I was studying Tractate Ta'anit, Masechet Ta'anit, um, that mentions all of this stuff, is it talks about being in mountainous regions, and in Colorado we are in a mountainous region, and it's, it says that snow in the mountains is five times more important uh, than rain in the valleys. Um, and this happens to be uh, very true from a climate perspective. The snowpack that is built up in the winter months in mountain climates is crucial for the way that the water trickles down through the rivers and creeks and, and in, into the land to, uh, to, for, the, for farming and everything else. So I, I think that the, on the one hand, there is this extraordinary wisdom that rabbis had, and they were in, in uh, Babylonia, which was, you know, Iraq, and there are mountains in Iraq, and maybe they did understand the eco-climate that they lived in. But when, when I was studying this with a group of people who know much more about a mountainous Colorado climate than I do, they were blown away by by that statement because it's it's pretty much exactly true. So I think that um, that moved me that there's wisdom in the Talmud. But exactly as you say, Rabbi Jonathan, there's just this this new relevance to these prayers as we face the crises, the the climate crises, the weather events that we're going to see more and more of, and water is so crucial it can be extremely dangerous and destructive and it and it and it is life it's a life force um as as has been mentioned already it is something i've struggled with is the timing of our prayers on the whole relates to the land of israel so we stop praying for rain saying tame tal umatar grant rain and dew um with the beginning of Pesach, and yet we faced a drought throughout the summer here in England. And looking in the Shulchan Aruch, the custom is to pray for rain in your own land, in the general bracha, um, Shomea Tvila, God you hear prayer. And I've been struggling as I say that bracha in the weekday Amidah, and I've been adding to it, and I've been saying, God, hear the prayers of the birds, because there have been dead blackbirds found, because there's nothing yeah. to drink. And hear the prayers of the of the ground creatures. I've been putting out water actually in some of the park areas because what are they to live on? And hear the prayers of the trees. And I've been finishing it. Probably yes. I shouldn't. Baruch Ata Shamea Shomea Tfilat Kol Chai. You you hear the prayer of all living being. I can imagine that you you perhaps resonate with that. I don't know how you feel. Absolutely. I mean you. you we see in all of these climate disasters, the impact on wildlife is devastating. When we've had these massive fires, the amount of animals, either domestic pets or the animals in the wild. And in Colorado, we have, you know, many, many deer and elk and bears and raccoons and all kinds of other mountain lions. And, and many of them are affected. I'll have the wisdom and ability to keep safe, but I, I definitely think of the impact on the whole of the nat natural world um you know and of course seeing the trees and the and the you know the forest fires that we're seeing you know that are burning right now in some states in california and oregon um they are primarily the result of just extreme dry summer and when you see those trees those dry trees just go up in flames it's devastating and the trees have been something that's been so important for, for you and me and, and all of us really and just the devastation of trees animals and, and plants just from the, yeah. is the, the other side you know fire and water we think of the the, the elemental um, repercussions of all of this and the fires that happen are a result of a lack of water fundamentally I mean there's other 
obviously other reasons that that, that go into the causes for a for a forest fire but yeah absolutely there's a prayer and i know you've written a very beautiful prayer um which you were composed a number of years ago for rain and water and we're going to conclude with that but just before we do that i um Mincha and Yom Kippur is something one can easily sort of miss out on, but there's actually a very beautiful prayer there, which refers to all the things you just mentioned. Nimata um, Baruch, from the world below God, let you be blessed. Nimaim Adil, from the might of the waters, and may there arise a voice from the rivers, Ume Eret Zeme, and a song from the earth, Ume Eit Sim Renen and music from the trees, um, harim reked, and dancing from the mountains, um, shiv, and song from the hills, this sense of the capacity of nature to rejoice and be itself a praise of God, and the, the horror that we might actually be impeding and preventing nature from uttering its praise to God as it should. Let's go to your prayer, Rabbi Mark, with which we'll conclude. Thank you. We'll just tiny bit of context uh, in 2013 there was a devastating flood in boulder and both my home and the and the synagogue that i serve congregation bonnet shalom were were very seriously flooded and we were we were homeless for for quite a few months while we mitigated that flood and repaired the damage so and i was really confronting this idea because the flood happened uh, just before Yom Kippur. So when we came to Shemini Atzeret that year and we were not in our own home because of the flood, I was thinking, how how can we pray for rain? And so I wrote uh, a different prayer called After the Flood, a prayer. And, uh, and I was asked to write it for the rabbinical assembly. Out of the, the flood waters, we cry out to you, El Shaddai, to say, die, enough, it has been enough. Let the drowning earth dry out once again and show us the reassuring promise of your rainbow. As we celebrate the joy of the gift of water and as we prepare to pray, as we prepare to pray for rain, let us remember that when it is withheld, the soil is parched and nothing grows. But when the torrents flow without limit, our rivers burst, our homes flood, and we tremble at its power. Water has given and water has taken May water be blessed, and may it bless and nurture us, not destroy us. In these bad days, protect us in your shelter. As we sit in the fragile shade of our temporary dwellings, help us feel your presence holding us in our insecurity, rocking us in our vulnerability, comforting us for all that we have lost. May your clouds be clouds of glory, not of devastating rain. As we hold and shake the sacred leaves and fruits and branches, may our bodies and souls dance in the joy and the danger of our natural world as we remember the delicate balance of creation and our need to sustain it so that it can sustain us. Give us the courage to ask for help from our community and to be there for our neighbors. May hands of friendship restore our hope and our homes. May shiva ruach umawid hagashem the one who makes the wind blow and the rain fall. We have seen your power. Now impress us with your gentleness. Rafa'enu, heal us and give us the courage and the patience we need to rebuild the inner strength and humility to listen for the lessons in this great mystery. Chazak becha el adunai. May we be strong. May we be wholehearted. May we never lose hope. Amen. That's a wonderful, wonderful, powerful prayer. And it hasn't lost a touch of its relevance since you composed it. Thank you, Rabbi Mark. Thank you, Dr. Michael Gilmont. And may this be a year of blessing in a year in which we all learn to do what we have to do so that the earth will bring us God's blessing. Thank you. Amen. Amen, amen.